Thanks, Brian. Terry's presentation is on the history of the Mother Lodge uh, uh, drawing, and that will be given by Brother Tom Wood, uh, as I say, the past master of the Lodge and currently the provincial grand master of, of Conning. Um, I would ask you please to uh, hold any questions until the presentation is complete and we enter our question and answering uh, session. Verbal questions will be uh, allowed a wee bit later on, but initially uh, the questions will come through the chat group which uh, uh, Charles Winston will, will uh, monitor and advise us on. But let me first of all uh, 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 ask our Grand Master Mason, Brother Ramsey McGee, if you'd be good enough to give a, a, a fan some more detailed introduction to our speaker this evening, Brother Tom Wood. Uh, Grand Master Mason, uh, Brother Ramsey McGee, if you would please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Good evening, brethren. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome you all uh, to this first presentation uh, put together by the, the History and Heritage Group. Our speaker tonight, Tom Wood, probably doesn't need any great introduction at all to most of you. Tom is indeed a, a third generation Freemason. His grandfather and his father before them were initiated into Lodge St. David, Turbouton in Mochlin, number 133. But his immediate family moved to Prestwick, uh, just round about the time when all the mines in the Mocklin area were closing in the late 60s. However, his grandmother and grandfather didn't follow to Prestwick until a later date. Tom was initiated into Lodge Prestwick 1060. And that was back in 1974. And because Tom had gone into Lodge Prestwick, his father and grandfather decided to follow suit. And they too joined Lodge Prestwick, which caused a bit of confusion because they were all called Tom Wood. So they were known eventually as Tam Senior, Tam Middle and Tam Junior, which seemed to solve the problem at the time. However, following his marriage in 1976, Tam Junior moved to Co-Winning and affiliated to the Lodge Mother Co-Winning in 1980. Thereafter, Tom has served the Lodge as its master from 1998 to 2000. He was the Provincial Grand Secretary from 2003 to 2008. The Deputy Provincial Grand Master from 2008 to uh, 2018. He was Grand Bible Bearer in the Grand Lodge from 2013 to 2018. And he is currently, as the chairman has already alluded to, the provincial grand master of Cowinning. So could I ask you, brethren, to please welcome to this uh, first Grand Lodge Zoom lecture, Brother Tom Wood, who will talk to us this evening about the history of Mother Cowinning. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Grand Master Mason, Brother Ramsey, for, for that very fine and detailed introduction of our speaker this evening, Brother. Tom Wood and Tom, if you're ready, I would now invite you, if you will, to uh, uh, proceed. And before you do so, just remind everyone to uh, remain muted and keep your videos on. Thank you, Tom. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Grandmaster Mason, for that introduction. Um, I'm sure Tom Senior and Tom Middle are looking down on us and saying, What the heavens is happening here? And we're actually talking to a video screen. But brother, I'd like to welcome you to the town of Cowinning. I live about three minutes walk from the lodge, so it's uh, right in the centre of the town. Brother, I would just like to, to start now and say, well, the lodge at Cowinning takes its origin from around the time of the building of the abbey, which was round about the year 1140. The ruins of the abbey still stand to the year of the lodge premises. The lodge, was, the abbey was built by the monks of the Tyronesian order. In all current publications of our history, we'll read that the lodge of Cowinning has no minutes prior to the year 1642. And one or two reasons are given for this. Firstly, they are thought to have been lost when the abbey was destroyed and the monks had to flee to France at the time of the Reformation or they were destroyed in a disastrous fire at nearby Eglinton Castle, the home of the Montgomery's, who were the Earls of Eglinton. 
However, in the year 2009, during a search in the National Archives of Scotland by our brother, uh, Lodge Secretary brother, David Wilson, classmaster, an earlier minute was discovered. It was found in a collection of the material belonging to the aforesaid Montgomery family. This minute is dated as the 20th of December, 1600. However, from 1642, we have a minute of every meeting that was held by the Lodge at Cowinning. Unlike other lodges, Cowinning does not have a charter or warrant from the Grand Lodge of Scotland, but instead is worked by special arrangement with Grand Lodge. Prior to the formation of Grand Lodge of Scotland, the Lodge at Cowinning was a Grand Lodge in her own right, issuing charters and warrants to enable other lodges to be formed many of whom still bear the name of Cowinning to this day. In the 2019 yearbook of the Grand Lodge of Scotland, you will find that there are 15 lodges in the role of the Grand Lodge who were originally chartered by Cowinning. With Scotland only being a small country, it was obviously not desirous to have two Grand Lodges. Therefore, the Grand Lodge of Scotland was formed in 1736. The Lodge at Cowinning was represented at the formation of the new Grand Lodge and continued to be so until it was decided to number lodges according to their seniority. With part of that proof being the production of minutes, as stated previously, Cowinning had no minutes prior to 1642. Now if we go back in time, we can refer to the Shaw Statutes, which were found in the Chapter Vault of Eglinton Castle. The first show statute of 28th of December 1599 were in the main a list of rules and regulations for lodges of operative masons to follow during the construction works. No lodges were mentioned in this statute. This was probably what we would refer to as the first Health and Safety at Work Act. However, in the second show statute of 28th December 1599, that statute refers mainly to Cowinning. And in the first item states that Cowinning was the head and second lodge of Scotland. The third item states, it is thought needful and expedient by my Lord General that Edinburgh shall be in all time coming as of before the first and principal lodge in Scotland and that Cowinning shall be the second lodge. And as of before is neutrally Maturely manifest in our old ancient ricks, and that Stirling shall be the third. Well, it's worthy of note that in these statutes, Shaw makes reference to Cowinning in eight out of 13 items. Cowinning always remained steadfast that it was the oldest lodge, and not receiving a rightful place, that being at the head of the role of the Grand Lodge of Scotland withdrew from that lodge, from Grand Lodge and continued to issue charters as she had done previously. On 17th of for a period of 64 years, Cowinning remained a Grand Lodge and during that period issued 30 charters, 26 to lodges in Scotland, two the lodges in Virginia, USA, one in Antigua, and the High Knights Templars of Ireland Lodge in Dublin. That state of affairs had lasted until a meeting was agreed to be held on the 14th of October, 1807, in the Star Inn, Ingram Street, Glasgow, between the Grand Lodge of Scotland and the Grand Lodge of Cowinning. The Cowinning Brethren at that meeting presented the Declaration of Perth as evidence that Cowinning Lodge was in existence some 465 years prior to 1658. That dates back to 1193. This meeting resulted in a suitable agreement between both parties. The most important of these being that firstly 
that Kilwinning shall renounce all rights of granting charters. Thirdly, that Kilwinning be placed at the head of the role of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. There was no number mentioned. And fifthly, that whoever Kilwinning appointed as their right worshipful master, he by right of that office became the provincial Grand Master of Ayrshire. Well, it was at this meeting that the Lodge at Kilwinning was first recorded as Mother Lodge Kilwinning. Brother Colonel William Blair of Blair, who had been made an honorary member of Kilwinning on the 22nd of September 1789, installed as Deputy Master on the 21st of December 1789, and as Grand Master of Kilwinning on the 21st of December 1805. He was subsequently, subsequently commissioned as the first Right Worshipful Master of Mother Kilwinning and ipso facto the first Provincial Grand Master of Ayrshire, serving as such from 1807 to 1808. It's a half yearly communication of the Provincial Grand Lodge of Kilwinning on the 17th of February this year, the original commission of Brother Colonel William Blair of Blair was presented to me by Brother Andrew Mushet, Mushet, Provincial Grand Master of Glasgow. He also presented possibly the last charter issued by the Grand Lodge of Kilwinning to Lodge Partick, Kilwinning, Glasgow in April 1807, which came via Brother Andrew Patterson, past Deputy Grand Master. Both of these I had the pleasure of presenting back to the Mother Lodge at the last meeting held on the 10th of March 2020, which was also the annual visit by Provincial Grand Lodge. So neither Mother Lodge nor the Grand Lodge made use of the number nothing or any other number during the negotiations. The number nothing does not appear in any co-winning minutes during the period, period 1807-1842. The first time it appeared in print was in the second edition of the Constitution and Laws of the Grand Lodge, dated 1848. This appears to have been an administrative action carried out by clerical staff at Grand Lodge and has now been accepted by the Brethren of Mother Kawinning and Grand Lodge. History shows us that from 1807 this agreement was honoured by both parties. However, in 1970, another agreement was forwarded to Mother Kawinning from Grand Lodge, which was agreed by the Brethren of Mother Kawinning, which contained in part the following. Prior to the election of the Master of the Mother Lodge, the Mother Lodge agrees to invite the Provincial Grand Lodge and the Daughter Lodges in the province of Ayrshire and recommend by a specific specified date a suitable brother for the election as master and submit the name of such a brother to the annual election meeting of the Mother Lodge, either as sole nominee or along with the name of any other brother or brothers duly nominated. Once again, the need for Masonic change was placed for winning in the 1980s and after much negotiation a new and binding amendment to the 1807 agreement was reached and again other co-winning gave up previously held traditions the most important being that of a right lustful master by right of that office being the provincial grand master of Ayrshire the last Right Worshipful Master and Provincial Grand Master of Ayrshire was the late Brother Thomas Samuel McCall. However, this new amendment gave the Brethren of Mother to winning new opportunities. These being that there will be erected and consecrated the Provincial Grand Lodge of Cowinning, with Mother Cowinning to nominate a suitable brother for the position of Provincial Grand Master. And B, that Mother Kilwinning shall for all time coming nominate a suitable brother for the position of Grand Bible Bearer in the Grand Lodge of Scotland, thereby maintaining its singular position in the Masonic world, and that Mother Kilwinning being the only lodge in the Provincial Grand Lodge of Kilwinning, 
and reporting through that body to the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Well, as you previously heard, I was initiated into Lodge Creswick in 10, number 1060 in 1974 and affiliated to Lodge Mother for winning in 1980. And at that time, the highest office, and I'll put this in inverted commas, where an ordinary member of the Mother Lodge could realistically achieve was that of Deputy Master, who actually carried out the duties as ma of Master more often than the installed master, as the installed master was the, also the provincial Grand Master of Ayrshire. Following this agreement, at the regular meeting of 8th November 1983, a unique ceremony, ceremony was carried out in that all past deputy masters were given the degree of installed master. This enabled them to sit at least in other lodges and attend installation works. The first right worshipful master of the Mother Lodge, installed in December 1983, was our late brother, Clifford Booth, a well-respected Mason. Since 1983, the Brethren can now progress through the offices to attain the position of right worshipful master, although this can take between 16 and 20 years. The Provincial Grand Lodge of Cowinnan was also consecrated in 1983 with Brother David Patterson, past Deputy Master with the degree of Installed Master, as the first Provincial Grand Master of Cowinnan. Brother, well, that brings us up to sort of modern times, but I'd like now to, to take you back and introduce you to possibly a couple of characters who were Masters and Grand Master Mason. I'd like to introduce you to William Boyd. William Boyd was the fourth and last Earl of Kilmarnock. He was elected master in December 1741 and installed on the 20th of January 1742, when he admitted the Right Honourable Alexander, Earl of Eglinton, an apprentice, and James Harper and Alexander Campbell as fellows of craft. His Lordship paid five guineas for the poor, as well as the expense of the day. I don't know if we'd have that many candidates nowadays, but if we still applied that part of paying the expenses of the day. On the 20th of December, 1742, it's recorded that the Earl of Kilmarnock, the initially elected Grand Master Mason, was absent in Edinburgh. He served as Grand Master Mason from 1742 to 1743. The Lodge elected a new master, namely Right Honourable Alexander Earl of Eglinton, who had been admitted apprentice the previous year, with his brother Archibald Montgomery as his deputy. However, the life of William Boyd, 4th Earl of Kilmarnock, was cut short due to his part in the 1745 Jacobite Rebellion. He was captured at Culloden, transported to London, tried and found guilty of treason, and thereafter decapitated on the 18th of August 1746 at Tower Hill. Another worldly brother is Sir Alexander Boswell, first baronet of Auchinleck, master of the Muller Lodge 1821 to 1823. He's reported to have used the funds of his inheritance to pay for a seat in Parliament and thereafter successfully sought a baronetcy. On leaving Parliament, he wrote a series of virulent but anonymous attacks in two newspapers, The Beacon and The Sentinel, on a prominent Whig, James Stewart of Dunearn, citing him as a bully and a coward. Following a legal battle between the proprietors of The Sentinel, James Stewart gained access to the internal documents, which identified Boswell. As Boswell didn't apologise, Stewart challenged Boswell to a duel, which took place at Ochtertool, Fife, on the 26th of March, 1822. Boswell fired wide, however, Stewart didn't. He hit Boswell in the collarbone and he died the following day. Well, great examples of reasons why we should keep politics out of our lodges. 
Well, I would like to highlight how the public's perception of Freemasonry has changed over the years. As a youngster growing up in Mochland, a crowd of us would often go down the river air and would regularly walk around the Balak Mile Viaduct. At that time, I wasn't aware of its history or its Masonic significance. But let me give you a brief details of the laying of its foundation stone. The Balak Mile Viaduct is on the railway line from Glasgow to Dumfries. It is the highest extant railway viaduct in Britain, over 169 feet high, and carries the railway over the River Air between Northland and Catron in East Ayrshire, and is constructed of locally sourced red sandstone. On Saturday, the 5th of September 1846, special trains from Glasgow and Ayr conveyed the directors and friends of the railway company to the site at Northland. The officers of Kowinning Lodge were conveyed by train to Kilmarnock, where they joined the train from Glasgow. Masons from other lodges were picked up gratuitously at other stations along the route. A procession was formed to go from the village of Mochland to the site of the bridge. It was described as it extended about a mile in length and consisted of 26 lodges and 12 bands. The total number of spectators was estimated as between six and 10,000. The foundation stone was laid by George Fullerton Esquire, the most watchful Grand Master of Cowinning and Provincial Grand Master for Ayrshire. Following the ceremony, three tumultuous cheers that made the welkin ring were followed by a salute of 21 guns from the battery erected for the occasion. I'm sure you'd agree with me, brother, and that it must have been a magnificent sight. It makes you appreciate the standing our ancient craft had in those bygone days. I don't think we would get that reaction today. Some of the old traditions of the Mother Lodge, brother, and that at our regular meetings or when conferring degrees in sister lodges, all members and office bearers wear a working apron, which are a plain cloth apron and a green border. No jewels of office are worn except by the right worshipful master, who wears his on a collarette, and the past masters who wear their jewels on their left breast. On all other occasions, dress regalia is worn, including the annual installation in December, when we prayed through the main street of Cowinning behind the pipe band in all weathers. Be in Scotland, it's usually rain or snow. In our entered apprentice degree, the right worshipful master, as part of his lecture, gives the newly initiated a brief history of the lodge, some of which I've included in this presentation. In 2000, in the year 2000, the office bearers and brethren of the Mother Lodge, in conjunction with Brother Stephen Foster of Lodge of the King's Park, number 1386, compiled the old degree. This degree was based on a composite of rituals circa 1695 and was carried out in period costume and is set in Hugh Smith's house at the cross. This was intended to be done as a one-off but here we are 20 years later and it's still being performed by the brethren today when invited to do so by Sister Lodge's celebrating special occasion. On the Mother Lodge website, there's a short video depicting the origins of the Lodge on the Just Giving link, which is worth a look, brother. When we were doing this, when we were asked to compile this presentation, we were asked to, if we could possibly do a, a slideshow of some of the artifacts. Um, being in lockdown, I've got to thank the brethren who helped me obtain this by giving me access. So I don't know, I'd like to, I don't know if I can share the screen now. Can I get permission to share the screen? You should be able to now, Tom. Okay, thank you, Gordon. Mm-hmm. 
There we go. Well, this first slide here is, is the first premises that we occupied is the Charter House, which is in the ruins of Colinning Abbey. This is the front view of it. This is the rear view. The next one is Heath Smith's house, or the Mason's house, which is now a building of historical interest, by, which has been nominated by North Ayrshire Council. This next one, we don't have, this is the, the lodge of 1779. We don't have any recollection of it, but there's a resident of Cowinning who makes matchstick models from photographs and he presented this to us. Now this sits, where the position of this is about 50 yards down the road from the modern lodge in the space where the entrance is into Abbey Church. This is the, the front of our modern lodge which is 1893. It's a wee bit squashed, but it's just to get it into the slide. This is the inside of the lodge, for those who have not been there. Uh, this is looking towards the east. The master's uh, chair, secretary, treasurer, warden sit down here somewhere. This is a view from the east towards the west. The altar is worth a mention. Uh, this is the, old, the, the foundation stone from the lodge 1779, which was removed from the old lodge to the new lodge, which would make it approximately circa 1593. It's two foot by two foot by one foot. These are the mason's marks, but as you can see on the left, of, uh, from the minute books, um, and on the right is from Cowinning Abbey. Now, should you visit Cowinning, you, you, you will see these dotted about the street. I had to explain to John Miller earlier that he had visited Cowinning on many occasions and had never seen them. Street furniture has Mason's marks, as you can see all up the street. Now, the long seats are the only ones that do not originate, the marks don't originate from Cowinning. Some of you may be aware whose mark it is. This mark, this seat was placed in front of the shop which belonged to a late, one of our late brothers, brother Andrew Jimison, who was a keen, a keen Burns man, a keen Robert W. Service man, and a leading light in the town. The next one is an old Masonic charge book dating 1671 to 1675. It's not too clear, but you can see the words grammar, arithmetic, and astronomy down in the bottom here. Our next item is a Geneva Bible printed in 1599. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 7, it states, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaf together, and made themselves breeches. Here we have two collection boxes. The one on the left, the Lodge Charity Box 1765, came from the Old Lodge and has two keys. The one on the right is from the lodge of Cowinning Thistle Lodge of Three Gardeners, 1858, and has three keys. I don't know whether the gardeners were maybe a wee bit more suspicious than what the masons were. These are two items of World War I lodge passports from a brother E. McDermott and brother George Lawson. Now unfortunately, brother, I didn't take a copy of what they actually said. But these were issued to brother, as they say, in the 1914, 
and the departed to life. This next one uh, is Brother Harry Rank Sherwood Rankin, who was awarded the VC Cross of Legion of Honor in Coup de Guerre. The plaque, given the biography and the reproduction medals, were donated to the Lodge by Brother Archie Chalmers, past provincial Grand Master of Gershire. This next jewel is the Grand Lodge Commemoration Jewel, belonging to the late Colonel Louis G. Pearson, who was master 18, 1908 until 1912, and it's dated 1912, and he was a member of Grand Committee at the rebuilding of Grand Lodge. Here we have the fourth and last Earl of Kilmarnock, as you can see, at least his head's still in his body there. These pictures were taken in the lodge. Um, they're not great quality, but the best I can do at the time. We have Colonel William Blair of Blair, the last Grand Master Mason, the Grand Master of the Winning, and the right first Provincial Grand Master of Ayrshire. Here we have Archibald, the 17th Earl of Eglinton and the 5th Earl of Winton, right Worshipful Master, Provincial Grand Master, of 49 to 57 and Grand Master Mason 16 57 to 70 to 61. This last this picture here is, is the lane of the foundation stone at Malachmile Viaduct. And down in the bottom, it's not too clear again, I've got to apologize then, but down in the bottom there is a list of signatures of those who actually attended on that day. And finally, this relates to the special meeting on the 8th of November 1983 and commemorates the names of all the past deputy masters who received the degree of installed master on that night. I don't know how to get back now. That's us, right? Well, the information that I gave the prior to the 1983 amendment of the 1807 agreement was taken from the history of the ancient Mother Lodge of Scotland by our late brother John A. N. S. The minutes detailing the laying of the various foundation stones can be found in History of the Mother Lodge of Winning by our late brother Robert Wiley. Brother, on behalf of our right watchful master, brother Monroe McLean, the office bearers and brethren, of Mother Lodge. We hope it won't be too long until we're able to welcome you personally into the Lodge. Finally, I thank you for the opportunity to present this brief history on the Mother Lodge of Scotland. I hope you all stay safe and look forward to the time when we can all be united in harmony once again. Once again, Brian, I thank you. John, you're muted. So we are? Yes. Well, thank you uh, for such a, a detailed presentation on the Mother Lodge. Very, very interesting. Lots of statistics there and terrific photographs of uh, many items that you have in your museum uh, and all sorts of other things. And uh, I'm not sure if I can thank you for highlighting the fact that I've wondered the streets of Cloning many times and never noticed they were marked uh, uh, Mark uh, identifications uh, and all of that, that setting. Thanks for pointing it out at the time, not so much for pointing it out tonight, but thank you. Tom. <laughs> um, we'll move now to a question and answer session and I think uh, channels will uh, uh, hopefully have had some um, questions on um, the chat, but before he does, so I wonder if I might just ask a very quick question, Tom. You, you mentioned um, that there was it four lodges in uh, the USA, uh, yeah. including Virginia. Two, I beg your pardon. Uh, do you know if those uh, lodges are still in existence? I don't, John. Sorry. Well, that would be interesting to find out. Okay, thank you, Tom. Again, Charles, do you have some 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, could, could I start with a, a question of my own? And that is, you mentioned there was a minute of the Lodge on the 20th of December, 1600, which is your earliest minute. Yes. Can you tell me what that minute contains? <laughs> yeah, it, it contains a list of uh, absentees, a list of those who were there. Um, the, the bottom one is, it's, it's basically just going through the sort of procedures. The bottom one is quite interesting. It's by the which day it is stated that no brother of the craft within the lodge of Kilwinning serve nor work with David through Mason and Ayr until he satisfies Robert and Voyages of such wages as he has to him in his charge. So in other words, they've not to work with David through until he pays the man his money. So th this presumably was not considered to be the first minute of the Lodge, obviously no, the Lodge was, was no. continuing meeting, this was just a minute. Yes, they, they, I have been told by the, the, the brother the David Wilson that the archivist um, reckons that there are other minutes, but where they are, we have no idea. So you're, you're not far short of um, Mary's Chapel number one then in terms of minutes at 1600? 1600, yeah. And, and you, it would have been an operative lodge at that time? Yes, very much so. Can I just ask at this time, maybe perhaps uh, we should unmute the brethren and uh, just see if anyone wishes to ask any questions. Ian Robertson, number four, do you have a question? I do, yep. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Oops. Yep, am I unmuted now? Yes. Yep. I've got a fascination and have had since I joined the craft as to distinctions between operative and Freemasonic ceremonial as we know it today. Um, have you an idea, Brother Tom, when we move out of talking about wages and operative practices to specifically ceremonial practices that we recognise today as Freemasonic within your, your minutes and, and if so, round about what time? Um, I'm not sure if you're really honest, but I can certainly dig that up and get back to you on that one. And I say, we're, just, we're unfortunate we're at a time where we can't get in and get access to all the information that we would like to get. Right. I'll give you the right answer, but I'll certainly take a note of that. Thanks, Tom. Hey, Brother Mark Phillips. Brother Mark Phillips, you have a question? Yes, so um, I'm uh, in the Grand Lodge of Virginia, and I'm uh, looking for any of the two copies that you have of the charters issued by the mother Ken Willing. Uh, we have a Ken Willing Cross Lodge that received a charter from uh, Ken Willing on June 12th, 1756. But if there is any scans or copies, uh, I would love to get a copy. <laughs> Tom, did you hear that? I'm still here. I don't know the brother secretaries on the okay. on the forum. I don't know if David has any idea. Hmm. Well, I'll leave my contacts with uh, Gordon, and uh, if there's any way that I can get a, a, a scan of those two, that would be absolutely appreciated. Virginia. What was the number again, sorry? Uh, the dates? Yeah, 1754. Okay. Uh, uh, April 1754, the lodge was organized, uh, but it received its charter in June 12th, 1756. As Kill Winning Cross Lodge. 
or Kinwilling Port Royal Cross at the time? Can I hand back to you, uh, Chairman? Thanks, Charles. Uh, Brethren, uh, any other uh, questions for uh, for Brother Tom Wood on uh, Mother Lodge? Yes, please, John, if I may. Alexander, Alexander yeah. um, Tom, what a what an absolutely superb um, effort. Well done, you. And really difficult to be the first one. Uh, it sort of reminds me of the um, the, the wildlife um, footage where you see the, the chicks, the seagull chicks, jumping out of the nest down into the water. And you did an absolutely superb job. So well done. Um, just, I just want. I don't have a question for you, but I just wanted to um, say I heard. And I'm trying to get an answer um, back from somebody that my, my understanding is that the Grand Lodge of Peru are um, intending on consecrating a new lodge and the Grand Master Mason may well know this, um, quite near Machu Picchu. And I don't know what the full name of the lodge is, but part of the name of that lodge is Kilwinning, which is, which is pretty amazing. So just a, just a, um, an observation there to, to know that your influence, that uh, the influence of your lodge is still, uh, uh, you know, is still very much there and in, in new lodges being consecrated. Okay. Thank you. That's interesting. There's a, a trip out for Mother Cowening. Mark, you... Mark McCray has a question, I believe. Sorry? Sorry, Malcolm McCray has a question. Ah, um, hello, hello. Thank you very much for that, um, Tom. That was very interesting. And for those of us who have the trepidation of thinking about what we're doing later, you've broken the ice for us. So thank you very much. But one thing is, is I know that Old Inverness Kilwinning St. John's number six and Canongate Kilwinning were very early charters of Mother Kilwinning. Do you know if there were any earlier than that? Because that was about 1677. Uh, that that was the first one that we have, bearing in mind our minutes for 1642. Yeah. So the 1677 is planning it Yeah. Thank uh, you very much. Good question, Malcolm. Thank you. Anything else for Tom? Any other? Alec Crabe, brother Crabe, you have a question. Good evening, brother, and, and once again, can I add my thanks to brother Tom for that uh, wonderful history, most interesting and very enjoyable. Just to follow on from Brother Walkman there, it's our understanding that there's no record of Lord Jolden Mernesco winning St. John's number six, being awarded a charter from Mother Co winning, although our records show that there were two charters awarded by Mother Co winning, one in 1667, uh, which as you said was Cunningham Co winning and a charter awarded to uh, Lodge Goldemarness mm -hmm. in on the 27th of December 1678, and in our lodge room we have two charters uh, on the wall, two original charters. One we understand, although it's illegible now, from Mother Cowinning, and one from the Grand Lodge of Scotland in 1737. Uh, and oddly enough, the the lodge celebrated its tercentenary in six in uh, sorry in 19. 78. Also, your the, the little history of Mother Co winning, which my good friend and brother, brother Terry Storick, gave me. Uh, it, it says in, in that there is no record of the old Inverness Lodge receiving a charter. No, there's nothing in Alex, there's nothing in these uh, in these books that I've got here either. So I, I can only can only base it in what I'm not making things up, you know. <laughs> 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 we, we get bad enough. <laughs> it's, it's very odd. I'm, I'm just doing a history of our lodge, an early history of the lodge at present, and uh, it's it's in there that I, I was looking in, in Mother Co Winning's history, and as you say, it's not recorded, but we have a charter. Yeah, and we've celebrated the tercentenary. That's that's a possibility. Very very possible. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Any other questions for uh, Brother Tom? No? Okay. Thanks again, Tom, for a very interesting, very detailed uh, uh, summary of the history of the Mother Lodge. Uh, very interesting indeed, and uh, I'm sure uh, many of us have gone away and give some further thought to that and start to ask ourselves questions. And I know that um, uh, there are some, at least a good couple of books uh, that you sell in your shop there in uh, yeah. Yeah. the history that uh, we would recommend to the brand who want to delve a wee bit further. Uh, but again, again, thanks Tom for, for all the hard work and effort you put into preparing for this evening and for your presentation. Thank you. Ben, I'll show you your presentation. Well done. Well done. Thank you, well done. Ben, thank you to you all for your uh, attendance here this evening and for your participation. Um, our next um, presentation will be a week tonight, Thursday the 18th um, at 7pm uh, and a link will be sent out during the course of next week. Uh, on that occasion, the Lodge of Edinburgh, number one Mary's Chapel, will uh, give uh, a history of that lodge. Uh, there will be two brethren um, involved in that presentation. And the current master who is with us uh, this evening. Uh, is he? It's gone. Colonel Scott Harrison, the master. Um, and he will be assisted by Ewan Rutherford, past master of the lodge and the past deputy grand master. So that's something to look forward to in a week's time. As I say, uh, the link will be made available in the early part of the next week so that you can uh, uh, put that in your diaries if you will. I'm sure you don't have that much in your diaries at the moment, regrettably. So, um, put that in uh, now and uh, before we close down uh, for the evening, I would just offer the opportunity for anybody who wishes to please go to the CEO or make any comment. Everyone's unmuted now, brethren, so you're welcome to comment or write uh, Thank you, Brother Tom, for a fan. Fantastic lecture. It was beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent uh, lecture, Dr. Tom. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, Brother Tom. Yeah, well done. Well done, Brother Tom. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Most enjoyable. Lectures made very old because I remember attending, attending Grand Lodge from Sir James McFly with Grand Master Mason and Mother Cohen in question was being discussed. Some old things there. Thank you, Brother Tom, for a, a really fascinating presentation. I mean, certainly started us off. The big problem you've got is what do you leave out? What, what do you put in? You know, if, understandable with the history like uh, the other lodges. The other lodges are going to have the same problem. You know, what do you leave out? Not what you put in. But thanks very much again, Brother, for the, the comments. I'm much appreciated. Thank you. Well, you've set the bar high, Tom, and uh, I'm sure that those uh, lodges that are following over the next few weeks will do the best to, to match them this evening. John, can I just um, mm -hmm. my thanks on behalf of the brethren of the Mother Lodge presentation? I don't know whether you can hear me or not. <laughs> yes, David, yes. Um, if there is any brother who has any questions which Tom has taken notes of, Please get in touch with me at secretarymko.com and I will try to get some information for you. Particularly from the brother from Virginia and also the brother from Old Inverness. Secretarymko.com. Thanks very much for, for my talk, brother Tom. Any other I'd like to say goodbye. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Good night. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Stay safe, Alan. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Tom. Well done, sir. Thank you.